Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back. Please hit subscribe, please comment whatever you need you think you need to say but um, this week we're going to close out that first chapter of the bark notes the Jacob Walsh um, section and that is true there's Jacob Walsh in there but uh, we'll be closing out chapter one and then we'll be moving on to some other things for a while after this but uh, if you're interested and you kind of enjoy these videos go back review them all um, the bark notes part one part two and now today part three Riney made several trips with the party after that. Sometimes Herman was off on his own hook, but the old man Patrash was always one of the party. Sometime after Riney had told me the story, Helena, which is Julia, the old man and Riney came over from the mountain on horses that were miserably poor and one that they were packing. They came to the ranch about sundown and asked if they could get some hay and grain for their horses and something to eat for themselves. They said that a dollar and 75 cents is all the money they had and that they would like to keep that so as buy some grub and hay in Mesa, some 35 miles towards Phoenix in the Salt River Valley. I told them that they would have to do their own cooking as we had our, already had our supper, and that the horse feed was down in the granary, for them to help themselves, which they did. They stayed all night and struck out in the morning for Mesa. They camped there that night, and during the night the handbag that Helena, Julia, always kept in her possession, disappeared. Who got it or where it went, I do not wish to say. The handbag contained Jake's parchment, map of the mine, and how to get to it. Peralta's note to the two Jakes for $60,000, a bill of sale to the two Jakes to the mine, and Jake Walsh's naturalization certificate. Pages stuck together. I saw no more of them for a long time, but Pete, Pete would be Godfrey Patrash, the father. Um, a little confusion here because people will find out if they go through the history is that um, Godfrey Patrash was known as Old Pete, but Reinhardt Patrash in Globe later on in life was also known as Old Pete as well, so kind of the play on Patrash. I saw no more of them for a long time, but Pete showed up shortly after that and I hired him to keep the water holes clean tending the pumping and doing other odd jobs, but not as a cowhand. I let him have little Billy, a horse that was perfectly sound, but none of my cowboys could make him work. If a cowboy was riding Billy and took off after a cow, it just would simply be impossible to make him gait within the roping distance of the animal you were after. He was the gentlest horse I ever saw. You could crawl under him or between his hind legs or lie down on him when he was lying down, and he would never move. None of the cowboys would have him in the, as their mount. Pete being some 60 years old, I thought that Billy would be just the horse for him to ride between water holes. Pete had been working for quite a while, and I supposed he and Billy were getting along all okay, as I had seen Pete take his soapbox and get up on it, and from there put his foot in the stirrup and give a huge, give a lunge, and land somewhere on top of Billy, then scramble into the saddle, which was all right with Billy. I was riding in the house one morning when I heard a commotion in front of the open door. I looked up and there lay Pete with the box upset and the saddle on top of him. His nose was beginning to bleed and Billy was standing there with his head turned looking at the wreck. Pete got up and threw the saddle to one side and how ma oh how mad he was. He came to me and said I quit. I said nothing but had, had hard work trying to suppress the many laughter. I want my money. I did not hire out to break Broncos, and that's all I've done since I've been here. I was so full of laughter, I stepped out of the door where Billy was standing, and he had never moved. I looked at the saddle that Pete had forgotten to cinch him, and he didn't even put the latigo through the ring. So I had to take Billy and go down to the canyon to the well and pump. The first little hill I came to on the trail, Billy positively refused to go down, and no amount of spurring would free... Uh, would phase him. I guess it's phase. It says fees, but he could kick up behind and couldn't buck, couldn't buck a little bit. So I got off and started down the trail of the mesquite tree. 
and along came Billy following me down. I walked to the tree and got a good club, and by that time we had arrived on the level ground. I got on and everything was lovely until we came to another hill we had to go up. Billy stopped and he wouldn't go up. Up. Uh, another hill that we had to go up. Oh, no. Okay, well, this is kind of redundant here. Billy stopped and he wouldn't go up, pound as I would. Okay, I guess he was pounding him. He would buck like a cow. If I hadn't been in a hurry, it would have been funny. When I got back to the house, Pete was there and I coaxed him into staying. That I would get him another horse, a gentle one, but he refused to have any other, said he would conquer Billy or quit the cow business. So Pete worked for me for about another year and finally got Billy as fat as a hog. And Pete had to walk both down and uphill. One evening we were alone and Pete was in a particular good humor. He asked me if I'd ever seen old Jake's naturalization paper. And I told him no. So he got up and went to his old trunk and handed me the naturalization certificate of Jacob Walsh. A German naturalized in New Orleans in 1846. Now, this is interesting because earlier he says he didn't want to say who took the paperwork. And at the time when this is being written and early on, nobody knew that Waltz had actually filed his first naturalization papers in Natchez, Mississippi. Later, he actually became a naturalized citizen of Los Angeles. And this actually works because you're thinking that Waltz probably kept the paperwork of when he was looking for naturalization and from uh, Mississippi when he first applied, and he might have had those amongst his papers. But it also was something that was knowledge that was they hadn't found the naturalization certificate yet at this point. But Bark actually has it, um, the information here, and that it was true. It wasn't where he was natural, naturalized. It was where Waltz first applied for naturalization. Um, later, they found the actual naturalization papers and certificate in Los Angeles County. Quite some time later, Helena, Julia, married a man by the name of Schaefer. Um, this is Albert Schaefer. A resident of Salt River Valley, and I don't think she made any more trips to look for the lost Dutchman. But Pete made frequent trips to the Superstition Mountains till he passed on. I remember a bright moonlit night about 11 o'clock I heard the most unusual noise coming down the trail over the mountain toward the house. I could not, I could not make out what was coming, so I prepared as warm a reception as I could for whatever it was and waited. It would go clinkety-bang, clinkety-bang-bang. Then, all in chorus and louder and closer. When the human calliope arrived, it was old Pete, draped all over were his frying pans and coffee pot, tin cups, plates, and etc., and some bedding and other equipment. The explanation was that the Apache kid and his squaw had been seen by Pete that day, and that they had visited his camp taken what little grub he had, and then kicked things around generally. Pete concluded to immediately move, but under no condition could he think of leaving that $5 worth of camp equipment to the tender mercies of the Apache kid, hence the external decoration of old Pete. Herman, the older son, hunted with his father sometimes. When funds ran short, he would go to work in the mines of Globe or Miami, and after his father passed, he moved up to that country, making a yearly trip for the lost Dutchman. Always independent and honest, I could rely or, rely or depend on anything he might tell me. And um, there's a lot of... Um, Herman worked for a number of people, including the Martin family in the areas. In fact, he became so close with the Martin family, working for them and living on their property. He's buried in Superior in the family plot of the Martin family. Now, in regard to the monumented trails... I have followed it over the mountain without difficulty, and then the monuments could not be found for about two miles. When we found them along the trail where the cattle did not travel, thence over a divide into the horse country, where the monuments failed us again, but led us to a much more significant feature of the story. That is the cut mesquite timber. Helena, Julia, and Riney said that Jake told them that there were two pits at the mine about 75 feet deep and a like distance across the top and they were lined with mesquite wood and would drop about six feet, then an offset of about a foot, and then sew down to the bottom. Upon every offset, there would be a tow ladder, a stick of timber with uh, notches in it that a person would climb by placing their toes in the notches, taking hold of the timber with their hands, and finally reaching the top with a rawhide sack on their backs and a strap around their forehead, the sack filled with ore. 
it really was astonishing to see how fast, well, see how fast men, I don't understand, sometimes, I'm sorry, because the translation gets kind of muddy. It, re it really was astonishing to see how fast men were used to that kind of mining could come up from the bottom with a load of about 100 pounds. Okay, so it was how fast men could come up, okay, for 100 pounds. Now, those pits took considerable mesquite, and we positively have found where they were cut. And they could not have been cut for any other purpose than we can conceive. And they were all cut with an axe, a tool that Apache Indians never used. The cut timber must have gone down, as the cutting is on the top of the mountain and covers quite a large area. We have been working on the cut timber for several years, and we have found where they have quite, had quite a camp at, time, at one time just to cut and pack the wood. They must have left it in a hurry as we found a lot of small horseshoes, new, several kegs, gone to staves, and hoops, and as there is no water there and no other evidences of a camp. Now we think we know very nearly where the wood left the mesa and that will be our next attach, attack, this says attach in this, attack this winter. Jake also told them at times that Joaquin Murrieta the bandit with his gang would join with the Peralta outfit and come to the Superstition Mountains and to the Peralta camp as a mutual, as a mutual protection. And that as at the camp they had a Mexican racetrack, and that Muretti's outfit would run horses against the Peraltas. He said they would skin the Peraltas out of all the money they had, and that Murrieta had silver mines somewhere beyond, and they would move up on up to his mine for a load of silver ore. I have undoubtedly found that camp in the racetrack. I forgot to state that upon the death of Jake, the ground around his house was thoroughly dug up and nothing was found. The foregoing is practically the story of Jacob Walsh. With the wheat separated from the chaff is nearly possible as human possible to do. Now this is the first chapter of the Bark Notes. And um, this is Jim Bark recalling pretty much as much information as he wanted to relate at the time. Um, there's a little different, not different, but um, extra material in Sim Zeely's book, Lost Dutchman Mine, where Sim Zeely talks about some of Jim Bark's experiences of having met Waltz in town at Julia's store and so forth. He was, he was probably not friends, but he was aware of the, the gentleman and so forth. Um, again, you, so much of the information in this, you can kind of correlate and cord, coordinate with other things. Um, another time we'll do the epilogue to the Bark Notes, which talks about a number of the things that Bark and Ely found and how they related to the story. Um, of course, when you've read other books, you're going to say this doesn't sound quite like the other stories, but this is an individual who met Julia and Reinhardt and Gottfried and Herman who were doing the first search and getting firsthand information. Now, one of the things we've always all looked for, and I know a number of people were friends with the Ely and the Spangler families. Um, John Spangler was the nephew of Jim Bark and ended up with a lot of information. Everyone's always been curious of the 30 questions that were mentioned in here. And it was, what were the 30 questions? What were the answers to the 30 questions? Because those were the questions that Bark and Ely were directly looking and pulling from. And we don't always get this. Um, again, look back through these three parts. Um, Definitely something interesting. One chapter of 33, and, and we will hit a few of these other chapters over time because there's some really interesting stories. And it's great to hear the story written by an individual that was there in the time, knew the particulars, in fact, was friends with a number of the particulars at that time. So um, we will return, but thank you again. Um, pick up a t-shirt, leave a comment, throw up a like or a dislike if you like. But whatever you do, support us. Support us on Facebook, on Instagram, and support us here on YouTube. And don't forget, coming up this fall, as we continue to throw out little teasers and so forth through this summer, the film from Sun Art Films, Lust for Gold, all right? Featuring yours truly, along with um, Bob Shoes, Ron Feldman, Bob Kesselring, and a number of other people. So that'll be an excellent documentary film. Um, I think everybody will enjoy that I've been a big part of for the last couple of years. So thank you for watching, and take care until we see you next time on Legends of the Superstition Mountains.